So, good day everyone. I will be the third reporter for this set of reporting and my name is Rashid Amir Manko Ali and in this video I am going to report about the person-centered expressive. And so in this topic we have different subtopics which are consist of first the arts therapy and under this topic we will have a two subtopics and this will be principles of expressive arts therapy and next is the creativity and offering stimulating experiences so on the next topic we will have the motivational interviewing for the discussion and we will have four different subtopics and first is we're going to explain all about the mi or the motivational interviewing and the next is the mi spirit and third is the basic principle of motivational interviewing. And lastly, on this topic, we will talk about the stages of change. And for the last topic for this um, video, we'll be talking about the person-centered therapy from a multicultural perspective. So here we will be talking the uh, strengths and the shortcomings from a diversity perspective. So now we are going to start the reporting. And for the arts therapy, we know that uh, Carl Roger has a daughter, which is Natalie Rogers, and also a psychologist. And her work is expanding her father's theory of creativity using the expressive arts to enhance personal growth of individuals and groups. So Roger's approach, known as the expressive arts therapy, extends a person-centered approach to spontaneous creative emotional states. So those counselors actually that are trained in person-centered expressive arts offer their clients the opportunity to create movement, visual art, journal writing, sound, and music to express their feelings and gain insight from their activities. So basically, any form of art where they can or where they are able to express themselves. So we have here the principles of uh, arts therapy. And first, actually expressive arts therapy uses various artistic forms, as I have said a while ago. The movement, the drawing, the painting, the sculpting, music, writing, and improvisation. So towards the end of the growth, healing, and self-discovery. So this is a multimodal approach integrating mind, body, and emotion and inner spiritual resources. So methods of expressive arts therapy are based on humanistic principles but giving fuller form to Carl Rogers' notion of creativity. So these principles include the following. First is that all people have an innate ability to be creative. It's a natural. And next is the creativity process is transformative and healing. So meaning the healing aspect involves activities such as meditation, movement, art, music, and journal writing. So third is personal growth and higher states of consciousness are achieved through self-awareness, self-understanding, and insight. And then self-awareness, understanding, and insight are achieved by delving into our feelings of grief, anger, pain, fear, joy, and ecstasy. So we're going to focus on these feelings for us to further express our form of art. So our feelings and emotions are an energy source that can be channeled into the expressive arts to be released and transferred, or transformed rather. So the expressive arts lead us into the unconscious, thereby enabling us to express previously unknown facets of ourselves and bring to light new information and awareness. So it's kind of we are going to express what is hidden behind without us directly saying what we really feel. So it's through the art that we do this. And also, one art form stimulates and nurtures the other, so bringing us to an inner core or essence that is our life energy. And a connection exists between our life force and our inner core or our soul. And this essence, or this is the essence of all beings. And as we journey towards or inward to discover our essence of wholeness, we discover our relatedness to the outer world. And the inner world and the outer becomes one. So there is a unity, a harmony between the inner world, our inner world, and how we perceive the outer world. 
So the various art forms or art modes interrelate in what Natalie Rogers calls as the creative connection. And when we move, it affects how we write or paint. When we write or paint, it affects how we feel and think. So Natalie Rogers' approach is based on a person-centered theory of individual and group process, the same condition that Carl Rogers and his colleagues found basic to fostering a facilitative client-counselor relationship. Also help support the um, creativity. And personal growth takes a place in a safe, supportive environment created by counselors or facilitators who are genuine, warm, empathic, open, honest, congruent, and caring. So those are the qualities that are best learned by first-hand experience. Taking time to reflect and to evaluate these experiences allows for personal integration and many levels, like intellectual, emotional, physical, and spiritual. So next is we'll be talking about the creative and uh, offering stimulating experiences. So in here, according to Carl Rogers, actually, this deep faith in the individual's innate drive to become fully oneself is basic to the work in person-centered expressive arts. So this is the main point of this. Individuals have a tremendous capacity for self-healing through creativity if given the purpose or the proper environment. So when one feels appreciated, trusted, and given support to use individuality to develop the plan, create the project, and write a paper or to be authentic, then the challenge is exciting, stimulating, and it gives a sense of personal expansion. So again, according to Natalie Rogers, the tendency to actualize and become one's full potential, including innate creativity, is undervalued, discounted, and frequently squashed in our society. That's what uh, she really believes. That's why she's proposing this theory. So traditional educational institutions tend to promote conformity rather than original thinking and the creative process. So person-centered expressive arts therapy utilizes the arts for spontaneous creative expression that symbolizes deep and sometimes inaccessible feelings and emotional states. So the conditions that fosters creativity require acceptance of the individual, a non-judgmental settings, empathy, psychological freedom, and availability of stimulating and challenging experiences. With this type of environment in place, the facilitative internal condition of the client are encouraged and inspired a non-defensive openness to experience and an internal locus of evaluation that receives but is not overly concerned with the reactions of others. So, on the year 1993, Natalie Rogers believed that we cheat ourselves out of a fulfilling and joyous source of energy if we cling to an idea that an artist is the only one who can enter the realm of creativity. So, Art is not only for the few who develop the talent or master a medium. We all can use various art forms to facilitate self-expression and a personal growth. And that's why actually there are many forms of art. And right now in the modern era, we are trying to emerge and trying to understand different forms of art, especially those contemporary arts that uh, people are trying to express right now. And it also includes the the um, rapping that not everyone you know think of rapping as something as a form of really good art but if you are going to li uh, listen to some lyrics of the um, contemporary rappers we can see that there is really a form of art in them that the rhythm might be unpleasant for some but there is a message behind it so that's how it is so next is we move to the uh, motivational interviewing so for the motivational interviewing we have um, a definition of it being a humanistic and client-centered psychosocial directive counseling approach that was developed by William R. Miller and Stephen Rolnix in the early 1980s 
So the clinical and research application for motivational interviewing have received increased attention in recent years. And the MI has been shown to be effective as a re relatively brief intervention according to the study of Levensky, Kirsch, Cavazos, and Brooks on the year 2008. So motivational interviewing actually has been denied or defined rather as a directive client-centered counseling style for eliciting behavior change by helping clients to explore and resolve ambivalence. This is also according to Rolnick and Miller on the year 1995. So motivational interviewing is based on humanistic principle that um, humanistic principle and has some basic similarities with person-centered therapy and expands a traditional person-centered approach. So although it's under the um, person-centered expressives, it's quite different from art therapy because the art therapy is letting you express how you feel while the motivational interviewing is trying to um, motivate you from inside so you would have a change in the outside. So motivational interviewing was initially designed as a brief intervention for problem drinking, but more recently, this approach has been applied to a wide range of clinical problems, including the substance abuse, compulsive gambling, and eating disorders, and also the anxiety disorders, depression, and suicidality, and some chronic diseases. And healthier behavior actually changed practices, according to Art Kowitz and Miller on their study of 2008 and 2009. So MI stresses client self-responsibility and promotes an individual style or an invitational style for working cooperatively with clients to generate alternative solution to behavior problems. So MI therapists avoid arguing with the clients. Avoid assuming a confrontational stance or reframe resistance as a healthy response. Express empathy and listen reflectively. So they do not necessarily agree to their clients, but they respect the views of the client. So they do not try to push whatever they believe to the client. They do not want to inject it. They want the uh, belief to be coming from the client and they when they know the beliefs of the client that's the time they are going to assess it and give the right amount or the modified and personalized therapy for that client so now we are moving to the um, MI spirit so actually MI spirit is a rooted or MI is rooted in the philosophy of person-centered therapy. That's what I'm saying a while ago, but with a twist. So unlike, or unlike the non-directive and unstructured person-centered approach, MI is deliberately directive and is aimed at reducing clients' ambivalence about the change and increasing intrinsic motivation, according to the study of Arkowitz and Miller on the year 2008. So it is essential that therapists function within the spirit of MI rather than simply applying strategies for the approach. So that's also what I'm saying a while ago. They do not just um, give what's in the book or what's in the article, but they modify it to fit on the client, to the needs of the client. So the attitudes and skills in MI are based on a person-centered philosophy and includes using the open-ended questions, employing reflective listening, and affirming and supporting the client, responding to resistance in a non-confrontational manner, and guiding the discussion of ambivalence and summarizing and linking at the end of sessions. And then, they try to uh, elicit and reinforce change talk. So motivational interviewing works by activating clients' own motivation for change and adherence to treatment. So practitioners assist clients in becoming their own advocates for change and primary agents of change in their lives. So they do not basically try to manipulate and change the person, but they see to it that the change must come from, the idea of changing must come from the client himself. So in both person-centered therapy and MI, the counselor provides the condition for growth and change by communicating attitudes of accurate empathy and unconditional positive regard. 
So in MI, the therapeutic relationship is as important in achieving successful outcome as a specific theoretical model or school of psychotherapy from which the therapist operates, according to Miller and Rolnick in the year 2002. So both MI, again, and the person-centered therapy are based on the premise that individuals have within themselves the capacity to generate intrinsic or intrinsic motivation to change and responsibility for change rests with the client. So not with the counselors and therapists and clients share a sense of hope and optimism that change is possible. So once clients believe that they have the capacity to change and heal, new possibilities open up for them. So these are the basic principles of uh, motivational interviewing. So according to Miller and Rolnick on their study on the year 2002, there is a formulation of five basic principles of MI which are summarized there on the screen right now. So for the first, therapists practicing motivational interviewing strive to experience the world from the client's perspective without judgment or criticism. So MI emphasizes reflective listening, which is a way for practitioners to better understand and uh, or better understand the subjective world of clients. So expressing empathy is foundational in creating a safe climate for clients to explore their ambivalence for change. So if the clients find you threatening and you know you're trying to not respect their opinions, so they will not be that open and voluntary to give you the information that you really want. And that will hinder the process of change and the process of therapy itself. So anyway, expressing empathy is the foundational in creating or in, is foundational in creating a self-climate again for clients. So when clients are slow to change, it may be assumed that they have compelling reasons to remain as they are as well as having reasons to change. So for the next, we have the motivational interviewing as a design to evoke and explore both discrepancies and ambivalence. So counselors using MI reflects discrepancies between the behaviors and values of clients to increase the motivation to change. So counselors pay arguments for not changing. Or I'm sorry, counselors pay particular attention to clients' arguments for changing compared to their argument for not changing. So they are trying to give a focus to what the ideas of the clients instead of, you know, trying to push their own. So therapists elicit and reinforce change talk, as said a while ago, by employing respective or specific strategies to strengthen discussion about the change. So MI therapists assume a directive stance by steering the conversation in a direction of considering change without persuading clients to change. So they're not trying to tell you that your idea is wrong as a client, but they are trying to give you diff or they are trying to offer you different doors of change. They are trying to introduce you to new things so that you will have an idea or you will have the chance to uh, consider other portals so in order for you also to have the idea of maybe trying to change something in you as a client so clinicians encourage clients to determine whether change will occur and if so what kinds of changes will occur and when for the third we have the reluctance to change is viewed as a normal and expected part of the therapeutic process. So of course, there is also there is always a stage for the clients to have this kind of denial with changing because they are comfortable with where they are right now and how they are doing. So that's why it's quite um, uncomfortable for them to try new things because it may lead them to hostility. So that's why the counselors think of the denial stage as a normal thing for the counselors, especially on the first meetings. So although individuals may see advantages to making life changes, they also may have many concerns and fears about changing. 
So people who seek therapy are often ambivalent about the change, and their motivation may ebb and flow during the course of the therapy. A central goal of MI is to increase internal motivation to change based on personal goals and values of clients. It is according to the study of Arkowitz and Miller on the year 2008. So motivational interviewing assumes a respectful view of resistance and work therapeutically with any reluctance or caution on the part of the clients. So they respect and then they try to personalize their own way of doing the therapy so that it will fit to every client. So the fourth part or fourth principle of MI, practitioners operating from the MI orientation support clients' self-efficacy. So mainly by encouraging them to use their own resources to take necessary actions that can lead to success in change. So MI clinicians thrive or strive to enhance clients' agencies about the change and emphasize the right and inherent ability of clients to formulate their own personal goals and to make their own decisions. So MI focuses on the present and future conditions and empower clients to find ways to achieve their goals. So basically, it's being optimistic of what will happen to today and tomorrow rather than going back to the past and trying to dig everything from there. So that's it. So the fifth principle for the MI is when clients show signs of readiness to change through this or decreased resistance to change and increased talk about change, a critical phase of MI begins. So in this stage, clients may express a desire and ability to change and show an interest in questions about change, experiments with making changes between sessions, and envision a future picture of how their life will be different once the desired change has been made. So at the time therapists shift their focus towards strengthening clients' commitment to change and helping them implement a change plan. So. As I have said a while ago, there are different changes, which is why the denial is normal. So now I'm going to introduce you the stages of change. So you will have an idea how the client's thinking works. So first is the pre-contemplation stage. So actually it said here that the stages of change model assumes that people progress through a series of five identifiable stages in the counseling processes. So in the pre-contemplation stage, there is no intention of changing a behavior pattern in the near future. So this is quite the denial, but we call it the pre-contemplation. So next is the contemplation stage. So here, people are aware of the problem and are now considering overcoming it, but they have not yet made a commitment to taking actions to bringing about the change. So in the comp contemplation stage, the problem on the current system of the client are being introduced to them. So it's now clear to them that these are the problem. But then on this stage, they are not yet that uh, committed into doing the action. Parang they are hesitant on maybe the old system could work on that now that I know where really the problem is. So it's something like that. So when we, ha when we are in the uh, preparation stage, individuals or the preparation stage, action stage actually, is where the individuals intend to take action immediately and report some small behavioral changes. So they kind of try to inject a bit of new system in them and then try to observe if there is a change made by that uh, change or by that new system. So if there is, they're gonna talk to the therapist and um, report the new things. So in the action stage, individuals are taking steps to modify their behavior to solve their problems. So instead of before, they are doing the old system to uh, cope up with their own problems. Now, they are trying the new system presented by the therapist to them to try to figure out present uh, problems. And then they also try to report it to their clients or to their uh, clinicians rather. So now, on the last stage, the maintenance stage, during this, P 
people work to consolidate their gains and prevent relapses. So also there will be times that they could go back to their um, old system. But then now they are trying to maintain the stage of changing by trying to be more mindful of their actions and how they behave their attitude and behavior towards certain situations. So actually, people do not pass neatly through these five or people do not pass neatly through these five stages in linear fashion and a client's readiness can fluctuate throughout the change process. So if you quite miss something from there, the overall therapy will be quite wasted because there will you will have to go back to zero because there will be an error that will be made. So if change is initially unsuccessful, individuals may return to an earlier stage. So it's like they're thinking na sabi na nga eh, it's better to do the old way, parang ganon. So they kind of doubt na right now. So it's according to Prochaska and Norcross on their study on the year 2010. So MI therapists strive to match specific interventions with whatever stage of change clients are experiencing. So if there is a mismatch between the process and the stage, movement through the stage will be impeded and is likely to be manifested in a reluctant behavior. So kailangan, the therapist must always be mindful of what stage na is the client so he could give the right um, treatment for that. So when clients demonstrate any form of reluctance or resistance, this could be due to a therapist's misjudgment of a client's readiness to change. So it could be that the therapist might have introduced the change earlier than the, the desired or than the estimated time where he should be introducing it. So there will be a reluctance to the part of the client, parang, parang he is forced or something like that. So certain behaviors on a therapist's part may lead to client feeling invalidated or misunderstood. So that's why this the MI is quite um, very long to do. Very, it costs time, really. So which is likely to result in which appears to be the client's resistive behavior. And this is actually supported by the study of Levensky et al. on the year 2008. So working within the framework of a stages of change model, has implications of a therapist's role at a different stages. So Norcross, Krebs, and Prochaska on the year 2011 describe the relationship or the, re though, or the re relational stances, I'm sorry. Anyway, go back. Norcross, Krebs, and Prochaska of 2011 describe a relational stances and role taken by therapists during the course of therapy. So with clients in the pre-contemplation stage, the role is assumed or the role assumed is that of a nurturing parent. So when the client is in contemplation therapist or in contemplation, therapists function as a Socratic teacher who will encourage them to achieve their own insights. So for clients who are in the preparation stage, Therapists take the stance of an experienced coach. And with clients who are progressing into action and maintenance, therapists function in a role of a consultant. A termination or as termination approaches, therapists are consulted less often in the ways to foster client autonomy. So there are different, you know, quite a different way of you attacking the different stages of change. So that's how you should be doing it. So motivational interviewing is but one example of how therapeutic strategies have been developed based on the foundational principles and philosophies of a person-centered approach. Indeed, most of the therapeutic models illustrate how the core therapeutic conditions are necessary aspects leading to client change, where many therapeutic approaches including motivational interviewing, diverge from traditional person-centered therapy is the assumption that the therapeutic factors are both necessary and sufficient in bringing about change. So many other models employ specific intervention strategies to address specific concern that clients bring in the therapy. Moving on, we have 
we are now on the third part of this uh, video the third content which is the person-centered therapy from a multicultural perspective so this is where there is an emergence of this kind of therapy or approach in global aspect so we have two the strengths from a diversity perspective and the shortcomings from the diversity perspective so it's basically a pro and con or kind of like an advantage and disadvantage kind of like that or the strengths and the crisis so for these trends we're going to focus on how one of the strengths of the person-centered approach is its impact on the field of human relations with diverse cultural groups so person-centered philosophy and practice can now be studied in several european countries south africa or south america rather and japan and also there are some studies that has proven it so first is in several european countries person-centered concepts have a significant impact on the practice of counseling as well as on education so actually these these studies are actually presented on your written reports so i'm just going to read it in here and cross-cultural communication and reduction of racial and political tensions in the 1980s rogers elaborated on the therapy or in the theory of reducing tensions among antagonistic groups that he began developing in 1948 and also on the 1970s rogers and his associates began conducting workshop promoting cross-cultural communication and well into the 1980s he led large workshops in many parts of the world so international encounter groups have provided participants with multicultural experiences and in japan australia south america Mexico and the United Kingdom have all been receptive to a change or person-centered concept and have adapted these practices to fit their cultures. So there is quite a modification just to fit in their culture and it's actually okay. So shortly before his death, Rogers, the father Rogers, conducted intensive workshop with professionals in the former Soviet Union. So on the article of Cain on the circa 1987, sums up the reach of the person-centered approach to cultural diversity so our international family consists of millions of persons worldwide whose lives have been affected by carl rogers writing and personal efforts as well as his many colleagues who have brought his and their own innovative thinking and programs to many corners of the earth that's how cain quoted his uh, regards to to uh, the late Rogers and there is no doubt that Carl Rogers has had a global impact so his work has reached more than 30 countries and his writing have been translated into 12 languages and in addition to this global impact the emphasis of the core conditions make a person-centered approach useful in understanding diverse or diverse worldviews so the underlying philosophy of person-centered therapy is grounded on the importance of hearing the deeper message of the client. So empathy, being present, and uh, respecting the values of clients are essential attitude and skills in counseling culturally diverse clients. So again, on Cain's article, now on the year 2008 and 2010, contends that although person-centered therapists are aware of the diversity factors excuse me they do not make initially or initial assumptions about individuals so they realize that each client's journey is unique and takes steps to tailor their methods to fit each individual so that's what i am trying to say a while ago so every client is unique therefore you cannot really follow what's written on the book rather you have to get the essence the gist of all that's written there and then try to personalize it for every client that you are going to handle so that's how it works so several writers considered person-centered therapy as being ideally suited to clients in a diverse world so again on the article of Cain, views his approach as being a potent way of working with individuals representing a wide range approach or 
representing a wide range of cultural backgrounds because the core therapeutic conditions are qualities that are universal. So, Bohart and Watson on their study on 2011 claimed that the person-centered philosophy is particularly appropriate for working with diverse clients, populations, because the counselor does not assume the role of expert who is going to impose the right way of being on the client. So instead, the therapist is a fellow explorer who attempts to understand the client's phenomenological world in an interest, accepting and open way and checks with the client to confirm that the therapist's perceptions are accurate, motivational, or rather, motivational interviewing, which is based on the philosophy of person-centered therapy, is a culturally sensitive approach that can be effective across population domains, including gender, age, ethnicity, and sexual orientation, according to the study of Levensky et al. on the year 2008. So next is we go to the shortcomings of the diversity perspective or from a diversity perspective. So now there are lots of quite a crisis in um, emerging it in the uh, uh, global field. So although the person-centered approach has made significant contributions to counseling people from diverse social, political, and cultural backgrounds, there are some shortcomings to practicing exclusively within this framework. So many clients actually who come to community mental health clinics or who are involved in outpatient treatments want more structure than this approach provides. So some clients seek professional help to deal with this crisis and to alleviate emotional problems or to learn coping skills in dealing with everyday problems. So because of certain cultural messages, when these clients do seek professional help, it may be as a last resort. So they don't consider it really as the main because of the differences that brought by the emergence of it in the different uh, diversity perspective. So they often expect a directive counselor and can be put off in a professional who does not provide sufficient structure. So a second shortcoming to this view is that... Uh, it is difficult to translate the core therapeutic condition into actual practice in certain cultures. So communication of these core conditions must be consistent with the client's cultural framework. So consider, for example, the expression of therapist, congruence, and empathy. So clients accustomed to indirect communication may not be comfortable with the direct expression of empathy or self-disclosure on the therapist's part. So their view of how empathy should work is quite diverse. There is a difference in them. And that could hinder. So for some clients, the most appropriate way to express empathy is for the therapist to demonstrate it indirectly through respecting their need for distance or through suggesting task-focused interventions. So this is on the study of Bohart and Greenberg on the year 1997. So the third of the shortcoming from the diversity perspective is that in applying the person-centered approach with clients from diverse culture pertains to the fact that this approach extols the value of internal locus of evaluation. So meaning the humanistic foundation of person-centered therapy emphasizes dimensions such as self-awareness, freedom, autonomy, and self-acceptance, inner directedness, and self-actualization. So in collectivist culture, clients are likely to be highly influenced by societal expectations and not simply motivated by their own personal preferences. So the focus on developing or the development of individual autonomy and personal growth may be viewed as being selfish in a culture that stresses the common good said the Cain, or said on the article of Cain on the year 2010. And also, the same article contends that a person from collectivistic cultures are oriented less towards self-actualization and more towards intimacy, 
connection and harmony with others and toward what is best for the community and the common good. So consider the Lupe's case, but actually the case of Lupe, who is a Latina client, is very well said or very detailedly presented in the chapter to 12. Anyway, right now, I'm going to introduce you the case so you will have an idea when going there. So, Lupe is a Latina client who values the interest of her family over her self-interest. So, from a person-centered perspective, she could be viewed as being in danger of losing her own identity by being primarily concerned with the role or with her role in taking care of others in the family. So rather than pushing her to make her personal wants as a priority. So the council role will explore Lupe's cultural values and her level of commitment to these values in working with her. So it would be inappropriate for the counselor to impose a vision of the kind of woman she should be because of the differences in their culture. So although there may be particular shortcomings in practicing exclusively within a person-centered perspective, it should not be concluded that this approach is unsuitable for working with clients from diverse cultures. We just need to modify it even more and make it better for so that it could be used by many nations with uh, following their own cultures. So there is a great diversity among any group of people and therefore there is room for a variety of therapeutic styles. And again, according to the article of Cain on the year 2010, rigid insistence on a non-directive style of counseling for all clients, regardless of their cultural background or personal preference, may be perceived as an imposition that does not fit the client's interpersonal and therapeutic needs. So counseling a culturally different client may require more active or activity and structuring than excuse me. Anyway, structuring than is usually in the case of a person-centered framework. But the potential positive impact of the counselor who or who responds empathically to culturally different clients cannot be overestimated. So that's how it worked. So now you have, we are done on the three different parts or topics in this video. And now we are going to have the summary and evaluation of all of it. So for the summary, the person-centered therapy is based on the philosophy of human nature that postulates an innate striving for self-actualization. So further, Roger's view of human nature is phenomenological. That is, we uh, structure ourselves according to our perception of reality. We are motivated to actualize ourselves in the reality that we perceive. So Roger's theory rests on the assumption that clients can understand the factors in their lives that are causing them to be unhappy. And they also have the capacity for self-direction and constructive personal change. So change will occur in if a congruent therapist makes psychological contact with a client in a state of anxiety or incongruence. It is essential for the therapist to establish a relationship the client perceives as genuine, accepting, and understanding. Therapeutic counseling is based on an I or thou or person-to-person -person relationship in a safety and acceptance of which client drop their defenses and come to accept and integrate aspects that they have denied or distorted. So they become vulnerable to their clients or the, to their therapist rather. So it becomes a person-to-person -person relationship. It's quite intimate than Although there is a professional sense of professionalism, but also the the reaction, how they should provide empathy towards each other should be person to person, meaning it's quite intimate in a good way. 
And also, the person-centered approach emphasizes this personal relationship between client and therapist. That is, the therapist's attitude are more critical than our knowledge, theory, or techniques employed. <clears throat> In the context of this relationship, clients unleash their growth potential and become more of a person they are uh, capable of becoming. So this approach places primarily or primary responsibility for the direction of therapy on the client. And in the therapeutic context, individuals have the opportunity to decide for themselves and come to terms with their own personal power. So the underlying assumptions is that no one knows the client better than the client. That's why there is this idea of summoning the change from yourself because even the therapist who is quite trained in in analyzing the behavior of a client or of a person is not fully capable of understanding how a client should heal his self. So that's why a client knows better than the uh, therapist for himself. So in short, the client is viewed as an expert of his or her own life. And this is supported by the article of Cain 2010. So the general goals of therapy are becoming more open to experience, achieving self-trust, and developing an internal source of evaluation and being willing to continue growing. Specific goals are not suggested for clients. Rather, clients choose their own values and goals. So current application of the theory emphasizes more active participation by the client or by the therapist rather than was the case earlier. And counselors are now encouraged to be fully involved as persons in the therapeutic relationship. And more latitude is allowed for therapists to express their reactions and feeling as they are appropriate to what is occurring in the therapy. And also, person-centered practitioners are willing to be transparent about persistent feelings that exist in the relationship with their clients. They cannot just forcefully insist their own views about change or about the person or the client's current system. So they have to be very flexible and also they have to be willing to be transparent. And... On the study of Cain 2010, it is a therapist's job to adapt and accommodate in the manner that works best for each client, and which means that being flexible is the application of method in the counseling process. So you cannot, again, just, you know, try to bring up yourself. However you know or how much you know don't really matter if you do not try to connect to your clients, meaning that you have to respect their opinions and you do not just try to insist that that is wrong. You do not tell them that what they're doing is wrong. Rather, you are just trying to steer the wheels and showing them a path to a better way of handling their situations. So that's how it is. Anyway, let's move on to the importance of the... Um, Empathy. So for the importance of therapy, or empathy rather, among the major contributions of person-centered therapy are the implications of empathy to the practice of counseling. More than any other approach, person-centered therapy has demonstrated that therapist empathy plays a vital role in facilitating constructive change in the client. So on Watson's article on 2002, he had this comprehensive review of the research literature on therapeutic empathy as consistently demonstrated that therapist empathy is the most potent predictor of client's progress in the therapy. Although the, the therapy itself or the basis, the concept for where you get your therapy is important, how you build a rapport, a connection to your client is much more important than the therapy itself because you are trying to connect to them. 
and you cannot just simply inject your ideas without you being able to be relatable and also relate to your client. And for that, indeed, empathy is an essential component for successful therapy in every therapeutic modality. So, uh, person-centered research has been conducted predominantly on the hypothesized necessary and sufficient conditions of therapeutic personality change or therapeutic personality change in on his studies with years of progress. So, most of the other counseling approaches cover or covered in this book have incorporated the importance of the therapist's attitude and behavior in creating a therapeutic relationship that is conductive to the use of their techniques. So for instance, the cognitive behavioral approach have developed a wide range of strategies designed to help clients deal with specific problems. And they recognize that a trusting and accepting client therapist relationship or client therapist relationship is necessary for successful application of these procedures so it's not just about you being professional but also you being a person that is leveled to them to which they could relate you know something like that so in contrast to the person-centered approach however cognitive behavioral practitioners contend that the working relationship is not sufficient to produce change. So they contend that active procedures in combination with a collaborative relationship is needed to bring about change. So that's how the cognitive behavioral therapy is differed from the person-centered therapy or approach. So they contend that the active procedures in combination with the collaborative relationship are needed to bring about the change. Innovations in person-centered therapy is one of the strengths of the person-centered approach and also quoted that the development of innovative and sophisticated methods to work with an increasingly difficult, diverse, and complex range of individuals, couples, and families and groups, again according to Cain. So a number of people have made significant advancements that are compatible with the essential values and concept of person-centered therapy. So there on the module, like really on the module, you can see on the table 7.1, there is a description of some of the innovators who have played a role in the evolution of person-centered therapy. Anyhow, Rogers consistently opposed the institutionalization of a client-centered school. Likewise, he reacted negatively to the idea of founding institutes, granting certificates, and setting standards for membership. He feared that this institutionalization would lead to an increasingly narrow, rigid, and dogmatic perspective because it's quite becoming standardized. So when it is standardized, there is no way or there is a lesser way of the therapist to be more empathic towards their job and their clients, you know, things like that. So if Rogers were to give student in training advice, it would be, there is no best school for therapy. It is a school of therapy you develop yourself based on a continuing critical examination of the effects of your way of being in a relationship. Meaning... Or Roger, as I take on Roger's account or this claim, what I understand is that what he's trying to say is that it should not be standardized. It should really, the, the master, the mastery of the technique should come from experiences, multiple experiences of the therapist and also how he tried to personalize the therapy for which he will be more useful and, again, relatable to his clients. And it would not like look like there is a gap between the client and the, the therapist because there could be a point, according to Cain, that uh, there could be a feeling of inferiority from the client's perspective. Anyway, let's move on. The emotion-focused therapy is one of the developments associated with the person-centered approach. And it is the emergence of emotion-focused therapy, or EFT, 
that uh, Leslie Greenberg on his 2011 said, It is a prominent figure in the development of his integrative approach. Emotion-focused therapy, or again the EFT, is rooted in a person-centered philosophy, but it is integrative in that it synthesizes aspects of gestalt therapy and existential therapy. So EFT is a therapeutic practice informed by an understanding of excuse me by an understanding of the role of emotions in psychotherapeutic change. So a number of strategies in EFT are aimed at the goal of strengthening the self, regulating effect or regulating affect and creating new meaning. So many traditional therapies emphasize <clears throat> conscious understanding and a cognitive and behavioral change, yet they often neglect the foundational role of emotional change. So EFT emphasizes the importance of the awareness, acceptance, and understanding of emotions, and the importance of awareness and the visceral experiences of emotion. So in EFT, clients are assisted to identify experiences, accept, explore, transform and manage their emotions so a premise on EFT or emotion focused therapy is that we can change only when we accept ourselves as we are try to recognize the flaws in our system and the flaws in us so when we try to accept this so this approach has been a good deal to offer with respect to teaching about the role of emotions in personal change and how emotional change can be a primary pathway to cognitive and behavioral change. Other therapeutic approaches are increasingly focusing on emotions. For example, both psychoanalytic and cognitive behavioral approaches are giving more attention to the role of emotions and are rapidly assimilating many aspects on EFT. So lastly, the strength of EFT is that it is an evidence-based approach and idea that is increasingly being emphasized in graduate programs, according to Greenberg in 2011. So that actually ends the coverage of this report. And so for the continuation of this, we have to listen to the next set of reporters and this is again me, Rashid Amir Ali, and saying goodbye to you for this video and this content.